Ooh. That's definitely recording something over here. <laughs> well, hey, everybody. Stern lady um, said, recording in progress. <laughs> right. <laughs> Dan, this is, I feel like I've known you for at least a couple years, just our preliminary conversation here. Um, I'm having a ball just chatting you up right now. Uh, the folks at home or listening, wherever you're listening, if you're going for a jog, if you're on, uh, if you're in your car, um, you're hopefully in for a treat with this episode, um, Dan Thomas. And where do I begin here, Dan? You asked me, and I would have been curious as well, when we were confirming our, our time schedules. Hey, Dan, oh, by the way, where did you discover me? And I said, well, I ran a Google search on Dan and musician or Dan songwriter, and I landed on your website. And I was a couple tracks in, and I thought I've got to at least reach out to this guy. Because, again, some people assume that I just contact anybody, and that's not true. Um, if I see a story there or I see something original um, that I just think would be a great guest and someone that would be very appealing and inspirational, to my listeners, uh, I at least take a shot. So, Dan, just thank you for making time for the podcast today. Thank you for that uh, that very flattering uh, introduction. Um, yeah, I did. I did laugh when I got your email that said I googled Dan and musician, and <laughs> that really did. <laughs> I, I that gave me a chuckle. I enjoyed that. But uh, no, thank you for reaching out. It's a uh, the the fun thing is that when I at first got your email, like. I've spent, I've been doing this for a little while now. And anytime I see emails, anything that resemble that at all, for the longest time, they're not, one, they're not really, you can tell that they're not really addressed to you and they're quite generic. And so I'm kind of used to sort of seeing those and feeling like, yeah, this isn't someone who actually wants to interview me. But then I actually looked and saw, okay, no, he's, he is addressing me by name. Like there are details in there, so I'm just about getting to that stage at my with of my career now, if I can call it that, uh, where I'm getting genuine offers to come and do these sorts of things, and I'm like, oh, that's nice. Um, so I'm still not used to it. So I still looked at the email, but hmm, I don't know. Let me let me look into this guy. Let me see see his podcast. I'm like, oh, it's a it's a real podcast. Yep, this is this is legit. All right, I'll I'll email him back. I'll see what happens. And uh, yeah, I'm glad I did because. Like you said up top, the uh, the conversation so far has been what we would call sparkling. <laughs> yes. Well, we both have small children, and so we had um, some very relatable. Uh, we had a very relatable discussion about that. And uh, Dan, when I when I first visited your site, and I always like to check, you know, if somebody at least has their music out there for download, that's important too because I want to be able to promote it. So. Uh, you can find Dan Thomas on Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you find uh, on any streaming platform. Uh, the artwork really jumped out at me. I thought, well, that's really neat and um, and original, and it's it's really eye catching. And then when I jumped into some of the tracks here, um, I think in particular, "Loving You Ain't Fun Anymore." This is on this is on the latest release. I thought, and I thought, is Dan peering into my past? Uh, it, it feels <laughs> like he's describing a relationship, a relationship to the T. Um, and then I got to Ghost in the Mirror. I mean, that one really uh, hit me deep. And, and they, I feel like there's something for everyone here, Dan. Um, what I like about your music is it's introspective. But you you go to places that some songwriters don't quite go that they don't quite go that far, and and these are subjects that are um, near and dear to people. They are deep in their minds, deep in their um, conscience, and it may be some things they don't want to think about anymore. But but I think it's healthy to address some of this stuff. And um, without me rambling too much more. Take me through your songwriting and how some of these so songs like these come out. You know, Loving You Ain't Fun Anymore, The Darkness in Me. I watched that video. It took me back to that time period and the isolation, which I think is still relevant to some people today. Just uh, take me through some of your um, create your creative process. Well, I, I, 
I, I don't know. I, for those of you who are watching the video version of this, uh, you can see there's a small white door behind me. And after that, uh, that very glowing uh, set of uh, reviews from uh, the wonderful Mr. McArdle here, I don't know if I'll be able to get my head through that door anymore. Because uh, yeah, so thank you very much for all of that. Um, yeah, no, uh, writing process. It's like m with me, it's uh, the key thing for me is 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 to find out a, a hook, like a um like a, a melodic hook with the vocal when i'm sitting down to write it, it varies but the general trend has been that i will have a guitar in hand and i'll just i'll play around trying to find a chord sequence that i like uh just to just to see if i feel like that there's something i can work with excuse me uh and uh then once i've got that i'll just like hum or just make like phonetic noises just to to see if I can find a, a tune that I like. But once I've found that uh, melodic hook, like a, a a good example is it in the song, uh, Holding On To You, when I kind of came up with that, and I'm holding on to that, that melody, I was like, oh, okay, yep, that is, that's that's something. It's not there yet, but there's there's a that's an idea that's worth chasing. And then once I've got that, that's when you kind of develop, for me, you develop what the melody is going to be. And then you write the lyrics and then you kind of massage the two together to see how it works. Sometimes the, the lyrics end up influencing the way that the melody goes, like it changes it a little bit. Uh, and, then, and then sometimes the lyrics just spend time going, no, the melody has to be that. The lyrics have to be here. So it's a case of trying to chop things and get syllables out in places. And then eventually it, it feels right. Sometimes it's a really quick thing. And sometimes it takes absolutely forever. And sometimes there are songs that have been in the works for years and they still haven't found their right, to their final format. The very interesting that you mentioned Ghost in the Mirror, that started life as a, as a rock song. That was very kind of, that melody was very... Uh, uh, but me and my producer kept looking at, at recording that one and then it never... We never we were never entirely happy with how it sounded, and then I started playing with because uh, I really love Fleetwood Mac, and I partic I like the uh, like the Lindsay Buckingham mirror Fleetwood Mac because Lindsay Buckingham is oh, it's an incredible guitarist. Yes, and uh, I I wanted to I, I really love the song Landslide that Stevie Nicks wrote with him playing guitar, uh, and you've got uh, that uh, finger picking pattern and up until that point I and still I still am to a degree like I, I've not been like a finger picky guitarist I'm more like a I'm a strummer with a plectrum but I thought I really want to learn that song and play it properly um so there's a there's a, a picking style called a Travis picking and um, I think it's named after a, an old country guitarist named Mel Mel Travis uh Mel, Mel Travis beg your pardon uh and it involves like uh your th your thumb going between two bass strings, uh, and then your your index finger and your middle finger like picking two higher notes, uh, which when you get it to speed comes up gets with that. If you're familiar with the song Landslide, it goes there. It's like that very kind of. It's it's like you got it, it's going between the notes in a really like beautiful wavy kind of sound and I thought I really 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 want to learn how to play that and I finally managed to crack that and then I sat down with Ghost in the Mirror and thought, I wonder what that sounds like with that kind of with, with that kind of playing to it and it just completely transformed how the song sounded and I went, immediately called my producer and said Martin I've got something I need to we need to do this you mentioned Fleetwood Mac and the timeless quality to their songs Fleetwood Mac um, is not 70s music. It's not 80s music. Those songs, and I remember hearing the dance for the first time uh, to date myself. I think that was in the late 90s when they released that live album. And they were not um, really on my wavelength at that time. I was listening to a lot harder and heavier music, but I was working in a record store. And I think that's around the time that it was released. And I just love, I mean, I play drums, so I just love Mick Fleetwood's sound on that album. It was so crisp, just so in the pocket. And um, Stevie and Nicks, <laughs> Christy McVie, and just the way they complimented each other. And yeah, I, you know, I don't want to say that uh, Dan Thomas is a spitting image of Fleetwood Mac, but 
I see what you're saying there. When I listen to your tracks, going back to that timeless quality, Dan Thomas's songs, they don't sound like uh, songs from the from the 2020s or the early 2000s or the 90s. They just kind of have a, a quality to them that 10, 15, 20 years from now or longer, they'll still be, still be very appealing. Um, you also seem to harness this energy into your songs where they could be blown up in an arena. Like you could play some of these tracks um, on a grander scale and it might work. You know, um, I think All the World's a Stage, the, the, the chorus in that song um, is just a booming chorus. And uh, yeah, I could see where some of this stuff, you, you almost have some freedom there where you can take it to an intimate audience or you could take it to tens of thousands of people and reinterpret it is that do you go for that or does it just come out that way it's like yeah it's it's not it's it's definitely not something big thank you once again for that beautiful compliment uh it's not something <laughs> i i I, don't, I never think about it in terms of like where these songs are going to be played i'm usually i'm just like it's in terms of where it all comes from i mean i i, I don't want to get too uh too artistic about it all but it's like it's there's that whole idea of like no one ever really knows where it comes from and like so a lot of us in the artist community often feel like we're it's like we're channeling something like just it's almost like you you black out and then you come to and go oh there's this there's this thing there's this piece of art and and who knows it's kind of like it's ephemeral isn't it, it just kind of comes out of the ether but uh usually it's usually I've, i find it's there's something on my mind and then i just I'll find a mood and kind of go right. Okay, there's a mood to this. What kind of what am I thinking about? What's been bothering me? Uh, the uh, that that fits with that. Or I'll I, I have. Or I also have a bunch of notes. Excuse me on my phone uh, that uh, where I've just like written down little ideas. Maybe it's a little lyric or two. Maybe it's just, it's literally nothing but here's an idea for a song. Something about this write it when you get the chance um and i'll just i'll flick through and find something go, oh yeah that that'll fit quite well with with this and it just it comes out that way it's it's never been a case of like oh could this does this sound is this something that could be replicated in like an arena or anything i i've never dared to dream yet that my music would be played in in arenas at the, at the moment i i'm i've i've been playing in uh, in the corner of uh, of pubs and, and bars and or any uh like small grassroots music venues that uh, are um uh generous enough to to have me play i've i i, I don't have any kind of like grand I don't, I don't. I have no delusions of grandeur about what I do and what I write. I mean, but all of that stuff would be absolutely lovely, and I will never deny that. But yeah, it's um, yeah. So I, 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 like I say, I guess the, the short answer to that is uh, no. I don't ever think about what the, how they would sound in an arena setting, but uh, I might start to now. <laughs> well, there's just a. I I feel like the real authenticity to these songs and um. There's also some female vocals, and I was going to ask about that. Um, who is the uh, the backing singer on some of those tracks? Like, I, I think it's The Ghost of Me and Loving You Ain't Fun Anymore and maybe a couple others. Uh, so there's a couple of different people. Uh, the one on Loving You Ain't Fun Anymore is uh, is my wife. Uh, that's, that's Nicola Thomas. Uh, and uh, just <laughs> for those of you that haven't, uh, haven't heard it uh it, may, it might, might be funny the fact that I'm saying that my wife sings on a song called Loving You Ain't Fun Anymore. <laughs> um that that song is about an ex uh lover of mine uh from a very long time ago um and yeah she's she's always loved that because that one my wife has loved that one sorry because uh it's just it's got all that that kind of country music vibe to it i remember i wrote that song on a plane uh and i i i, I don't actually drink alcohol anymore at the time i still did and i think i was just drinking whiskeys on a plane and i and i just thought I'm just going to attempt to channel my inner Chris Stapleton and uh, and see what kind of like whiskey tinged heartbreak song I could come out because I was listening to a lot of that kind of that kind of country music at the time. I I, I love people like Chris Stapleton and Jason Isbell and like those kind of singer songwriter, not necessarily in mainstream Nashville country sounding uh, right 
country singers um and i thought what's what's my what's my version of that what what's mine and and I just went back to a well that I've been back to many times, which is uh, this one particular relationship that uh, for, uh, for for the sake of decency, I won't even name the person in question. Uh, and I do genuinely hope that she is happy these days. But uh, yeah, we were not right for each other. And it manifested in some ugly ways in in our relationship. Uh, and um, yeah, I like what you a, say. Yeah. I like what you say in the song, um, because this again really spoke to me um step by step here. Um, especially where the your family and friends, my friends and family told me that you were no good for me and I was heading for disaster. It was plain to see. That's exactly I think what has happened to a lot of people. If you get to be in your thirties or forties or older and you didn't marry your high school sweetheart, you're not still you know, you've probably gone through some version of this. Um that depending on the type of person you are, I mean, you don't recognize yourself at an earlier age as just pray for the wrong type of person. I mean, they see you from a mile away. They know that you're going to give them that supply that they so desperately crave. You're going to, you know, I think that phrase love bomb, you know, you're going to get love bombed by somebody and you're going to, they're going to tell you that uh, all these things about you that, um, you know, that are flattering and it, it's just a bunch of trickery. And before you know it, you're in too deep, but it happens to the best of us. Um, yeah. Yeah. I just heard, heard this song. I thought, wow, that is, um, I believe it was a relationship or two before I met my wife. And finally, I think the breaking point, hopefully people can relate to this. If you're in a situation like this, uh, people who are listening and you see the writing on the wall, but you're not sure how to get out when your father or let's say your brother or sister says, well, you can keep dating her, you can keep dating him, but I'll never have anything to do with them. If that matters to you, that was kind of the breaking point. I said, well, I'm not going to be able to bring her around the holidays, so this thing's over. I got to find a way out. You know, similarly, it was a, it was a very similar thing uh, with me in that um, often I've, I've had quite a few uh, relationships where th there are kind of like, there are a number of people in my life who are the kind of the sounding boards for mm, she's not right. And one of them is my sister. Uh, my, my younger sister is, is always is very good at seeing like my partners who I choose, like my parents, my mother, particularly because my mom's a very warm and welcoming person who will always do her best to kind of like, even if she has reservations about a person, she'll be like, "Well, they make they make him they make him happy," and uh, and and I'll, I'm perfectly prepared to kind of put a lot of my stuff aside for the sake of that. My sister is a little bit more direct <laughs> in that she she will she will look at them and go, "Nope, they suck." You 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 can, and I think that's I, I with this particular relationship, I sort of really sat down and said, "Look, what is it? What is it you have against her?" And she was like, "And just like." I just she just doesn't seem right for you and I just, I want better for you and uh yeah I mean that wasn't it wasn't immediate but that definitely that certainly um played on my mind for a while uh whilst going through uh that relationship in fact I remember scaring you usually I was gonna say you usually hear Sorry, you ahead. hear those comments um I was I was gonna say you usually hear those comments from a, your sibling when you just had the best weekend with that person and you've had the most fun and it's just, you're firing on all cylinders. And then you hear someone say, no, it, look, listen, Dan, trust me on this one. And you're thinking, but this is perfect. <laughs> I, I, I spent a lot of time in denial in that particular relationship. I, um, I, 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 well, I wasn't, or at least I just wasn't able to be, I wasn't able to be honest with myself in, in that emotion in that way emotionally but uh, I remember I, just to, to cap off the thing about my sister I remember scaring the absolute bejesus out of my uh my now wife by foolishly telling her like before she met my sister like oh yeah like uh, but, um, it's all right, it's right it's kind of really important like um get my sister my sister usually hates all my girlfriends I can't believe I looking back now in my late 30s I'm like I can't believe I said that to, to someone who I'd just started dating so like, oh by the way you have to really get over my sister otherwise she she'll hate you and because she always hates my girlfriends and yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of 
at this point in my life, there's a lot of me looking back on myself uh, and going, God, that was dumb. <laughs> that was idiotic. But yeah, there was a lot, part. Of, uh, lot of stuff in that relationship where I I wasn't able to be completely honest with myself. And, and interestingly, uh, at this point in my life, I'm also able to look back now after a while after i've written that song and kind of i'm able much more able to recognize the ways in which i got it wrong as well and that i mean not to excuse some of the behavior that this person indulged in but how i kind of like didn't help myself and like my own shortcomings that allowed that person to manipulate me more than they possibly would have been able to had i had a bit more of my own emotional wherewithal um again it's that it doesn't excuse any of the stuff that they did or said or made me feel but it's just i i definitely didn't help myself either i can completely relate to that and you probably weren't the best version of yourself looking back and you think well no wonder that thing ended up the way it did that experience but out of it came this wonderful song that I just encourage everyone, if you want to pick one track to get started on, I mean, I would recommend all of them, but Loving You Ain't Fun Anymore, you can find, if you just look, search Dan Thomas on your favorite streaming platform. Um, another song, and I know you're also working on some new material, but uh, The Darkness in Me, the video, um, I know it It does kind of specifically speak to that that COVID period. And I know in the UK, things were very restrictive. We had uh, over here in the States, uh, some things loosened up a little bit sooner, I think, than, uh, than overseas. But uh, the video captures it well, where you're walking around these empty streets that used to just be buzzing with excitement and people and good energy, and there's just nothing there. And you're looking up at the the lights and maybe some of the residential buildings, and that's where everyone is held captive, basically. And mm -hmm. what, what a, you know, I, I guess it was a sorrowful time for a lot of people. What, when you're out there performing now, uh, coming out of the pandemic, where it, it's hard to believe it's been three or four years, but are people in the pubs and in the bars over there, are they loosening up? Is everyone just happy to, are they resuming what they used to do? Or are there some people that are a little, a little tight, I guess, or how is it over there? It's uh yeah it's 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 mostly I think it's mostly back to normal in this I mean, I I think I think I said in um I've said in a, in a previous uh, interview recently is that sometimes I'm I I think it's almost like it's going to come too back to normal in the sense that we're in danger of like kind of forgetting a lot of the lessons that I feel like we were we were learning during COVID and particularly with regards to uh who are the uh in, who are what what are the jobs that are important to like keep society going and uh who the real kind of heroes of society are and who where we should kind of focus our attention and our efforts like we had a big thing about um clapping for the nhs over here like every on a for, for your american listeners uh, uh, on um on a thursday evening at 8 p.m uh during that first lockdown it, it, it started spontaneously. Uh, people would get outside 8 p.m. and just uh, across the nation and we just applaud for like a minute, two minutes. Uh, and it would be applauding for all of the emergency services workers uh, in our National Health Service. Uh, and it became like a weekly thing where we would go out and like just kind of go appreciation for that. And uh, now we're at the point where um, a lot of the, where the, the services uh, in a very dire strait and in a lot of crisis and uh the government kind of aren't giving them the funds that they need to do things so all of the uh, the nurses are kind of going out on strike and everything like that and all the papers are going back to their usual shtick of uh down with the strikes and everything else and it's like i think we weren't we like clapping for these guys like a couple of years ago and it's and it's things like that just make me think okay oh so none of that we're just going to forget all of that stuff happened. But sorry, I went off on a bit of a tangent there. Um, but uh, I can yeah, see that. Much. Apologies for that. Uh, the, this part may get cut. Um, the uh, oh, But the emotion, sorry. like you said, where the emotion just 
it dies down, you think, what, weren't we just um, all unified here and all on the same page? And now it's as if it didn't happen. Yeah, there were definitely, there was definitely like, I'd say between like that March and maybe June, end of May, June, there was, there's a real, there was a real feeling of solidarity here to me, at least. Uh, it just felt like for just that brief moment, it felt like the whole country and the whole world was kind of like, okay, this is serious. We're all, we're, we really are all in this together because this virus does not respect uh, age, race, uh, creed, sex, political affiliation or anything. It, it will, it has an equal opportunity to kill all of you. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that was kind of a real unifying factor. And then there were a, a bunch of like internal political things going on in this country. And then of course, things going on across the pond in uh, the United States. So obviously George Floyd kind of came within that first lockdown period for us. And then it just kind of reignited those sorts of things, reignited a lot of divisions again. And it was like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, we're, we're back to kind of shouting at each other on the internet again. It's like, oh, that lot, that was that was fun while it lasted. But um, yeah, we were, it was, at that time that I wrote that song, it was very, uh, it was like a month into the pandemic when I wrote that. It was, uh, there was, there's a place in Hartford where I lived at the time, Hartford in Hartfordshire, uh, called the place called Four Street, which is uh, where all of the bars uh, and uh, nightclub establishments are in that town. Uh, and at the time we were allowed out for 30 minutes of exercise every day. That was the only time you were allowed to leave your house. And because my daughter was only a year and a half old at that point and in need of a lot of care at home, uh, I took a lot of my exercise at night when both she and my wife were asleep. So I wandered into town and it was the Thursday uh, before Easter, um, which in the UK, we have like a four day bank holiday uh, weekend. So like we we get off work on the Thursday and then we don't come back until the Tuesday. So we get uh, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. As like a four day weekend, and normally on the Thursday of of, uh, of Easter uh, over here, um, everyone starts celebrating in that very British way, where we all get mind bendingly drunk uh, in a way that puts most other nations to shame, uh, not in a good way. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, you can see people on the street kind of being a drunken mess. But of course, there was nobody. This was like 10, 30, 11 p.m. Uh, and there was nobody out because everyone was on lockdown and all the all the businesses were closed and it was just so eerie to walk down Fourth Street, this place that's so vibrant and full of life in all of its glory and its shame, uh, to be just silent. And the only things I could hear were my footsteps echoing and like the the electricity from the lights humming. And I think maybe there was like a a car somewhere off in the distance, like one lone engine. And it was so eerie to look at. I could see, like above a lot of the uh, the establishments, there are a lot of uh, there are people, like people living in the buildings above, and you can see some of those lights on. And that's when I say in the summer, like signs of life high above, uh, where it's like you can see all of these people who are locked in their homes. That okay, well, life is still here, but it's like it, it can't get out. It can't do anything. And I just remember writing on my phone this stream of consciousness stuff, like all these notes. So thinking there is absolutely a song to be mined out of this somewhere. I, I would be insane if I didn't try and do something. Uh, so I went and wrote it all down and then I came back and then I just massaged all of the best bits uh, into, into something. And then that became that song, that music video as well. That is, that is four street that we filmed that one. That, and the next line I, I wrote down here, trapped inside till only God knows when. Um, people forget that if you were under certain restrictions in certain countries, you also had that, I guess, existential anxiety of how long are we going to live like this? Is this going to be another month? Is this going to be another year? No, you really didn't know. Um, I think that may Will have impacted ever? people. Will it ever go back to where it was? That was yeah. the other question. It's like, we, is it, is it, it, sometimes it was less a question of when will this end? It was a case question of will this end? Like right. When, 
wasn't a, it wasn't like a it was a guarantee at any point it was especially in the in the music industry uh because we're we were one of the, the first industries to close down uh and the music industry in the uk i don't know what it's like in the states i imagine not too dissimilar but uh it's still recovering it's 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 uh, it's there's there have been some lasting impacts uh from from covid that even though we've been out of restriction out of major restrictions now for at least 18 months uh the it's not bounced back in the same way the audiences haven't come back in the numbers that they were in the first place because some people like the the psychological damage uh if, especially if they were more vulnerable it's like it's it's done it's 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 been it's been broken now so yeah so so for some people they are still kind of those people who are trapped inside till only god knows when oh i, I think people really missed going to a live music venue during that time period and i think back to uh, 2017, 18, 19, and some of the performers that I'd see on the marquee at our, at our local concert hall. And then it just, it hit such a lull, even when um, the restrictions were lifted. Uh, even now, um, things are happening at this particular club, but it's like, I don't see that, um, it's not as many acts as you would think, or national acts that we used to get. I imagine it'll come back. And then, and, depending on where you live, maybe it's not as um, depleted, I guess. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's definitely, it's, it's definitely not bounced back fully over here. I mean, if nothing else, uh, a lot of the, um, a lot of the acts just couldn't, couldn't uh, sustain themselves uh, whilst we were in all the major restrictions. So a lot of them just have, have kind of have hung up their spurs and, 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 and have quit doing it now which is oh man is that that's that's heartbreaking you think all the music that you're not going to get now because of of, of things like that but uh, people had to yeah. make some difficult choices i guess if they had a day job um maybe some folks don't imagine that most musicians probably have some other career that they they've got to sink into um to pay the bills and um i guess there are some people that made those tough calls of wow i just got to put this on the shelf for a few years maybe not forever but i'm just not gonna be um pursuing this so many hours a week i, I just can't you know uh, sure. that's sad yeah. i mean yeah i i mean i don't i this isn't this isn't my full-time job either i i was i never thought i'd be in a position to say this but i i was very lucky that i had a day job that was not affected by uh, by COVID, I, and I again, I, I can't remember what kind of um, uh, what sorts of uh, um, protections and uh, like emergency packages and things were were put together in the states at the time. But we had a furlough scheme in the UK where um, if the companies kind of furloughed all their employees, the government was paying up to eighty percent of their wages uh, throughout uh, a, 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 a set length of. The pandemic which obviously ran up quite a large bill uh in the end um but uh i was lucky in that i didn't even have to get furloughed because my job uh could continue unabated i just had a lap i was just issued a laptop and just worked from home and i, I spent a long time kind of railing against that kind of life and obviously and i and i still um more about this and what i want to do versus the day job but i i, I remember thinking I, would, I never thought i'd be in a position to say man i'm, glad, I'm really glad i wasn't a, a full-time musician when that pandemic hit because i i know i know so many people who were musicians at full time and they just their incomes just completely evaporated overnight because they couldn't they couldn't get out on tour they couldn't really that some of them were rec able to record some things, but uh, as most of us know, um, recorded music doesn't produce uh, much income for musicians these days. And most of the money that any of us are able to make is that when we go out on tour, and particularly when we're able to sell merch uh, or, or or like synchronization deals with uh, like TV and film, which was another industry that was completely shut down, so there was nothing new happening there either. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's an industry that has. That, that got really really heavily hit and it's like i say it's still trying to bounce back now 
Well, Dan, I'm I'm glad that um, we didn't lose you. I know I just recently discovered you, but as far as losing you as your uh, uh, as far as your impact out there and the music that you're putting out and the new music that you're working on. And before we get too far along, I just want to run through. I'll also post these uh, your your tour dates coming up. Just want to speak to the December dates that you have scheduled. Um, for some of my listeners who are in the UK or Germany, uh, Dan, you're making a run. You're pretty busy schedule there the first few weeks of December. Um, Freefold, Dortmund. I'm I'm taking a shot. I haven't pronounced some of these uh, locales either in a long time, or this may be my first shot at. But uh, Zarbrücken, Stuttgart, Karlsruhe. I hope I'm pronouncing all that correctly. Uh, you these know, are some taking of them off December. I'm out loud either. <laughs> so, the, so some of them I'm hearing you read them back, and I'm like, that might be right. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but it's yeah, my December first. He books a lot of these. Uh, yeah, December first, second, third, fourth, fifth, um, and then you're over in Amsterdam on the seventh of December, eighth yes, right. in Luxembourg. Uh, but all these venues and dates, I'll also post on my social media pages as well. But a great chance if if you're in the UK, because Dan, this episode will probably come out on the nineteenth, so um, uh, there'll be a chance to see you there at the end of this month, and then going back into the first of the year. But yeah, what? Tell me a little bit of, about what you have planned. I know some things haven't been firmed up all the way, but um, some of the places you're performing. Yeah, so we got uh, there's a there's a there's a list of uh, of dates on my uh, on on my uh, my social media uh, that uh, shows how busy I am for the rest of the year. And only when I put that poster out, I realized, wow, I really am quite busy this year. That's crazy. <laughs> um, so I've got uh, where am I where at the moment? Was this the fifth today? Uh, so yeah, we've got. I, I'm, I'm doing a, a short run uh, in in Yorkshire and uh, Leicestershire, not Leicestershire, Lincolnshire uh, next weekend. So I'm going to be like uh, in, in Hull and Leeds and Scunthorpe. Uh, who would I miss? York. That's the other one on that on that little mini tour. Um, yeah, so I've got a little run there, and then there's going to be a run a lot of around like the Birmingham, Doncaster area. Uh, and then into, like you say, in December, we're going out to, to Germany and uh, the Netherlands and to Luxembourg. Then I've got a couple of smaller shows uh, over here, back here over in the UK. One's going to be for Christmas Eve, which is a very local show to me in a place called Clifton, which is like Bedfordshire way. It's a, it's quite a small village, but there's a, a pub called The Admiral on Christmas Eve. If you're in the Bedfordshire area, please come and check it out. It's going to be fun. Um, and then after that, the things that uh, they're not uh, they're not properly out there yet, but uh, we've got some plans for the new year that, that, that are going to be a lot of fun. There's a there's going to be a particular thing to keep an eye out for around February, where there's there's going to be a short tour uh, of sorts that will be used to record a music video, followed by a, a another European run in April, a longer one for a couple of weeks, and then. A UK run immediately after that, and then a very short break, and then I'm off to uh, Latvia and uh, Lithuania and Estonia for a run of dates as well, and that will take me through to the middle of May, and then after that I will probably sleep for a week uh, because I'll be absolutely <laughs> exhausted. Um, but uh, yeah, the, play, the there's going to be a lot more. There's, there's going there's a lot of live performances planned and in the planning stages. Uh, for next year that will run up into what I hope will be like a November-ish release for the new record that I'm currently working on. Oh, excellent. Dan, I wanted to ask, and I also don't want to get too far ahead without putting in a plug for um, your friend Martin Colton's podcast. I so enjoyed listening to this episode that you guys recorded, the BTS Creative Academy podcast. Please Download and subscribe to Martin's podcast anywhere that you listen to podcasts. I guess if you're listening to this one, um, just run a search on that. S, I'm sorry, BTS, Creative Academy. Um, one thing, I didn't get to the entire episode, but Dan, you were starting to talk about when people who you don't know come up and give you some feedback 
on the songs that they heard that night or, or what have you, that it's really cool to hear. I think for all of us, it's always um, nice to hear somebody's opinion who's not your friend or your cousin or your brother. Um, what is it like when, or do you have people approach you after a set who say kind of the same things like, what was that song you played, The Darkness in Me? Or what was that uh, Loving You Ain't Fun Anymore? That was a, that really spoke to me. Do you have people who come up afterwards and tell you what something meant to you or meant to them? I'm sorry. Yeah. And it's, it, it that's, that certainly happened recently, like over the last, let's say year or year and a, a bit now. Um, now I'm starting to do, get out there and do more and more shows. Uh, but um, yeah, like it's, it's always, it's amazing when, if you, if you have somebody who, who really connects with like one particular song and wants to come up and talk to you about that song afterwards and, and particularly like what it meant to them uh it's 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 incredible like the one of my favorite ones is that um so i have a i have a song that uh it, it's out it is out there's a version of it that's out on the streaming uh, platforms already it is getting redone as part of the new record that's coming out um it's a song called The Hole You Leave Behind, which uh, trigger warning for those of you who, um, who might be affected. It is a, it's a song about miscarriage. Um, me and my wife uh, attempted to start a family. And before we had our beautiful baby girl, uh, we we did. We, we tried once before and seven weeks into the pregnancy, uh, um, sadly, we, we lost that child. And that was was a, de a devastating week for us that where we were just we, we both then just spent the rest of the week off work both of our bosses were I phoned my boss and my wife's boss uh, the next day uh, after we found out and told them the situation and they were both they were both great they both immediately said oh, don't don't come into work we're just please be at home and stay with each other and just take care of each other uh, so yeah we spent that week kind of at home just grieving and holding each other and crying a lot of the time. And we, we also, we, we, it was a strange week. We had a lot of fun together and kind of grew really close. And sometimes we, we were laughing and then like minutes later, we'd be sad again and crying. And, and I did the only thing that I know how to do in terms of processing emotions is I thought I need to write a song about this. So I sat down and, and wrote about the, 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 the story of what happened um, and it's obviously it's it's a very sensitive subject. So it's the one it's the song that people talk to me about the most. Uh, and one of the guys that we we did a run of me and my tour manager did a run of shows in Europe in the April just gone, so April of this year. Uh, and the last show, um, I can't, is that within a, a place called Stolberg. Uh, and the guy who put uh, put the show on for us, uh, his uh, seventy year old dad was in the audience. So the, the two two local German guys, and I say I performed that song, and the 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 guy who was running it, Rob, came to me in the break, and he he wanted to talk to me about that song, and he said to me that that song helped me have a conversation with my seventy year old father in the audience about my sister who died before I was born. And that it, it totally blew me away. Absolutely, I, I was gobsmacked. I didn't. Uh, that I, it's like one of the heaviest things that somebody that, that a stranger has ever said to me. And I was, I just felt like kind of honoured and like flattered that I was a part of helping them have a conversation that could only really bring them like closer together to have this talk about this family member of theirs who was like was gone way too soon and who rob never got to meet um yeah so i just said I, I'm, I'm so glad i could facilitate that conversation for you and like moments like that as an artist it's like that's that's brilliant that's amazing for me it's like just to know that this this piece of art that i made that came from such an awful place like has helped to like heal people and that's and, and, and i don't want maybe that sounds a little bit too grandiose but like just to give them that kind of 
just to help them like process things and just and feel a bit more okay and a little bit less alone then that's job done that's 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 fine by me that song really um you know i hit my wife and i haven't experienced that thank god but when i first heard the song and if you haven't heard it yet i uh, don't want to give too much away but it does kind of start off maybe like a love song and um you know, I think it's the third verse, third or fourth verse, and it just hits you. And you almost have to go back, which I had to do, and and, and go back 15, 30 seconds and make sure that I, I heard the lyrics correctly. And um, yeah, it's um, one of the most powerful tracks I've heard. Because again, that goes back to what I said at the top of the episode. You approach some subjects in your songwriting um, that I don't want to say nobody goes there, but you don't see a lot of... Um, artists who are maybe presented to you by record companies. You're not going to hear this on the radio. I, I really, the more that, um, I mean, there's some good stuff on the radio and there's some, um, some good songs at the top of the Spotify playlist, but um, I, I think you really have to be open-minded and explore other artists because some of the best stuff is just not, it's not going to be as accessible Um and the it's country music radio, there's some very good songwriting out there. Uh, a lot of your top artists are performing songs that are written by other people. But uh, the emotional tracks, I think they just scratch the surface sometimes. And, sure. But, but that track in particular, I think that it's powerful. And it, it may, like you said, actually have a healing power for those who have gone through it or opens a conversation like you said yeah I'm, I'm glad you picked up by the way the um the the uh how the first it, it first it doesn't it's not obvious what it's about and it's cause i very deliberately wrote it that way that that the first two verses make it sound like it could easily be like uh, a romance that went wrong and that it's oh it's a love that's gone away and then the third verse it, it's very direct with no this is what this is actually about and yeah and it's, i i appreciate that somebody's kind of picked up on that because for the most part everyone's always said to me because uh, i used to be quite coy with what it's about until it got to that point um but people it, it meant that people were either not listening when i played it or they kind of said that they knew what it was all about so now i'm very upfront when i when I start playing it, I say, I tell, I like to tell the stories of the songs before I go into them on stage now, which means that I spend for some people's taste, probably a little bit too much time on stage talking. I, there are definitely some people who make that uh, opinion known. Um, but uh, there are also a lot of people, the people who kind of get it and like what I do, they, the, the people, they say, I love the way that you tell the stories. I love knowing more about what you're singing about and i think okay that's cool then you guys are my audience then you guys get it and that ties into what you were saying about um the different uh like the the the, the good stuff now not necessarily being in like the top 40 and and that is, is, i think it's a wonderful thing about music now is that everything is like everything's broken off into lots of small niches there's no you can you can sort of put it one way of like there's no like water cooler moments with uh with like uh film and television and, and music but what's what's beautiful instead is like now everyone's now got their thing it's like it, it used to be like the the good advice was like oh yeah you need to write like broad songs that like everybody can appreciate whereas the, the advice these days is like no, no 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 just dig down and find your thing because trust me there is an audience for whatever it is that you do whatever it is that you're into whatever kind of weird art that you want to make there are you've got the power of the internet now there are the hundreds if not thousands of people who will get what you're doing and and you and you can be therefore be more authentic that way which yeah it means like you say you you got to do the work you've got to like go looking for the stuff that like jibes with you but once you find it oh it's it's magic. Like some of my absolute favorite artists in the whole world have a very small, but very, very like passionate and uh, motivated 
fan base that will like that will that are they're passionate and motivated enough to give them uh the career that they need in order to keep going but they're they've got these wonderful levels of fame where they're to, to their fans to that little small community who know who they are and get what they're doing they're like they're like friggin' rock stars but like they could still just walk down the street and just be and be like some guy like no no it's not like they're not like ed sheeran or anything or like to use like i don't know a more american example it's like it's not like steve tyler or something they're not gonna like just say like oh my god there's steve tyler from aerosmith and like mob him or whatever uh they can just walk down the street and just get on with their day and just you know go to the post office or go to the grocery store and, and do their thing but like their fans like know them and will stop them and, and have a chat with them but yeah it's a, it's, a, it's the kind of fame such as it is that I that I would I would like I would like that kind of career where there's there's a bunch of people who know what I I do and really love what I do and come out and give me the career that I need but I'm also able to just go to the park with my child and everyone else there just goes oh it's some bald guy with his daughter you said something on Martin's podcast that I thought was so relatable and so refreshing to hear and Again, I want people to listen to this ep to uh, Martin's episode. Um, but when you said, "I don't need all these extravagant things. I don't have to attain all of this material wealth, and I just want my daughter to be happy and our mm -hmm. happy home. Our our home ha doesn't have to have. I mean, you didn't say it quite like this, but it don't have to have six or seven bedrooms and." the pool and the jacuzzi. I'll, I don't, I just want to have a happy, uh, fulfilled life. And I, you probably get more out of touching other people with your music and getting like, like you said, that feedback and uh, a, a creating something that resonates with somebody on a deep level. I, that's probably more fulfilling than the guy that's sitting on a mountain of money. Because yeah, I certainly and, met, I've met some old, wealthy folks, and not all of them look like something's lacking. But I would say a good number of them who I've met um, in my career, you think, geez, why are they not happier? How come their <laughs> children don't talk to them? When their adult <laughs> kids don't come see them, and they've, and yeah, they go play golf, they go, play, but they don't seem like they're as happy as I would think they would be. But there's there's something behind the eyes isn't there it's just there's like a there's a sparkle that's maybe not there but um yeah yeah, yeah without wanting to like tread uh, uh, retread too much of what i said on, on martin's podcast because yeah like uh like dan said uh you should definitely go check it out i, I think the only place that i know that's available is on youtube but uh but yeah definitely go check it out if you if if you're able to um but uh it's what i say on that podcast is like it, it is that, that some people are motivated by those kind of uh, more material things and that is absolutely fine it is not for me to say that that you should not be motivated by those things and it but what it comes down to is you got you have to work out what makes you happy and pursue that and, and if that's those material things that's fine that's not a problem uh, as long as you're not hurting anybody else in order to to do it um but yeah i just the, the more i kind of engaged with the world uh, the more i realized that that paradigm of success of like the the money the car uh the um the house and like all those material things uh you know i was i was born in the 80s and like we but like, growing up i mean i didn't grow up under margaret thatcher but like her legacy kind of definitely uh, uh, like like reagan in your country it kind of affected the discourse in in that way um but yeah, the more I grew up, like the more I questioned, like yeah, I don't, I don't think that's me. It doesn't like it certainly didn't motivate me. Like it definitely, it definitely wasn't something that made me get out of bed. It was just kind of like, yeah, okay, I guess. And then I sort of realized that there are other ways to measure success, and uh, it, it was all about like what worked personally for you. And yeah, and for for me, it's. Me and my wife are a lot more about experiences rather than than, than things. Don't, don't get me wrong. We we have a we have a pretty comfortable existence. We're we're quite quite sort of happily 
middle class and I will never pretend that we're like, oh, we're poor and we're happy. But um, yeah, we've we're, we're we're reasonably comfortable, but it's like we don't it's not our lives aren't defined by that. And it's more about like pursuing the things that the experiences and the fulfillment that will make us happy for my, for my wife. She's starting out in self-employment um, as an ADHD coach. Uh, and for me, it's my music. And then for, for both of us between us, it's just, it's raising our daughter into like this kind person, this kind, this wonderfully kind and wonderfully funny person that she is, because those are the things that both of us value is, is kindness and humor. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's about finding, finding your own path and f- finding what success means to you. That's beautifully spoken. It's not judging other people for what they're seeking. Um, because some people, everyone is, is different. Everyone's wired differently. Um, mm-hmm. but, um, I, I relate to what you're saying. I like to, if my children are happy and I know that you have a background in theater and acting and, um, Again, Martin went over some of this stuff as well, but um, my son, my oldest son, Warren, he had his first summer camp this year, and I thought about a, maybe a traditional camp, but then I stopped myself and said, wait a second, he's always reciting things. He, whether it's a movie he's been watching or when he comes home from school and recites a whole lesson plan, uh, he has this weird thing where he recites the entire plan. And so we enrolled him in a theater camp and he so enjoyed it. And I think that's, uh, I would recommend any of my listeners that have children, nobody's more in tune than you are to their tendencies and their, um, their quirks and their interests. You know, if you, if you see something there, put them in a position where they might really thrive, you know? And, uh, so we put him in this theater camp and, um, I, I wish we could have him doing something all throughout the year. We just don't have the budget for it right now, but certainly we'll, we'll do another camp because he loves that sort of thing. And I know with, with your daughter too, um, is, does she enjoy what you did growing up? Yeah. I mean, uh, she, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. She currently goes to, uh, there's something on a, like a Saturday morning uh, called uh, called Stagecoach over here where it's like a, they just get it's like an hour and a half and it's like they they do like uh dance and singing and 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 performance and and everything like that and yeah she's she she really loves it i we always hoped that she would and she would enjoy any kind of you know being theatrical because me and my wife are, were both theater kids like growing up and up until like fairly recently we were both still doing uh what we would call uh, amdram in this country amateur dramatics like uh community theater i guess you guys would call it there um but uh yeah so we we kind of we always thought ah oh, well it's obviously what makes us happy is, is that she finds the things that make her happy but like we always thought mm, it would be really nice if it was the theater because obviously we share that we'd have that we'd be able to share that passion with her and it, I, I am not a, I'm not a sports person at all, but if my daughter turned out to be into soccer, I would be like, yep, I'll be watching her every Sunday morning. I will cheer her on. I will learn the rules and 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 pretend that I like it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm glad that she's not into that uh, and that, that theatrical stuff seems to be more her more her thing. Also art, art's her thing, like drawing and colouring. She'll happily sit down and just draw and colour things for what feels like forever uh but uh yeah it's great it's she does seem to enjoy that stuff i mean i don't it's very early on in all of that at the moment but uh i was told i picked her up uh yesterday uh from a session uh and i was told she has the loud she had the loudest voice when they were doing the singing i thought okay that's good i don't necessarily know if that means that she's the best but uh she's definitely got the confidence to to project it so that's that's cool that's fun I, i'm glad that she's she's having that fun at the moment maybe the apple didn't fall too far from the tree <laughs> uh, uh, yeah I, I think between me and my wife she wasn't going to have uh it, it was it it's not a, a massive surprise <laughs> <laughs> well 
Well, Dan, this has been fantastic. I mean, I could, I could talk about your career and, and um, just explore more avenues here with you. I know that you're, you're writing some new material. We mentioned a couple of times this conversation um, and you may have even already told me uh, when you're planning to release some new tracks. Yeah, that's right. There's um, th there's an album that's in the works at the moment. I'm currently demoing it uh, with the idea to, to to get a couple of uh, musicians I know to come and play on it. I've given like this has got like the rough ideas, uh, so that I can send that to them and say this but better, please. Uh, and then we'll demo it with with them on it, and then uh, we'll go in with a, a producer to to get it recorded. So that's all in the works at the moment. The idea is that the album will be out sort of like this time next year uh but there'll be a flock of couple of singles uh in advance of that throughout the year like hopefully april time april may will be like the first one and then there'll be maybe one or two more uh between that and the album release so yeah it's throughout 2024 there there should be releases coming uh so yeah watch this space gracious listeners and uh we will have Dan Thomas music for you to listen to very, very soon. Dan, I almost forgot. Listeners, listen, I feel like I'm uh, like Stephen Colbert. Um, everyone who listens to Dan Time and enjoys this podcast, please interact with my guests on their socials. Dan, your Facebook page is, you're so interactive. Uh, that just really struck me. It is a fun destination for people to follow your music the the videos on there um uh and i specifically i think you had you were on your way to a show in um st albans maybe is that correct yeah coming back for you i love that um <laughs> Uh, I just, just turn on the stuff. camera and I just I just chat nonsense when, when I do it because that's that's just me and I go yeah well they send that on put that on the internet. <laughs> it's really great because I go to a lot of pages um, for different we'll call them creatives you know and I wouldn't say that anybody's doing it wrong but the but your approach to interacting and connecting with your fans you re really make it a fun experience for them they get to see. Um, a different side to Dan Thomas. If whereas they just listen to the music, you've got one impression. But then they see, oh, he's got a great sense of humor too. Um, and then I like you. what you had, what you had posted about um, very you know algorithms and yeah. I mean, I wouldn't have discovered your music if I just hadn't run that ridiculous Google search. And I'm so glad that I did. And uh, one of the one of the my. My hope for this podcast is that the concept of Dan talking to other Dans will at least inspire you to find a common thread with other people. And whether your name is Steve and you're like, well, let me, I, shoot, I never thought about that. Let me look up uh, other Steves who play bass guitar or anything like that. Just we're more relatable than we think we are. And um, so that's what I'm trying to propose to promote here and i'm so glad that i discovered dan's music because of the concept of my show and that i'm able to expose him uh expose dan to my listener i, ha I have a i have a oh you your camera just oh oh dear i seem to have lost dan Oh dear. <laughs> Hello, Dad. Are you coming back? Hmm. I'm in this room on my own now. Guess I'll just wait here and see if Dan comes back. Makes it sound like I'm talking about myself in the third person.
Oh, I think he's back. Ladies and gentlemen, Dan hey. Mercado is back on the podcast. <laughs> oh, man. I am so sorry about that. You may have seen me scrambling a couple minutes ago. My my, I had this on my phone because I I'm able to connect the Bluetooth to my Pi Track, and uh, I was I was under ten percent. And this charger that I used, I guess I don't know. It's <laughs> I, I I just thought, oh, is that that's that's that interview over? <laughs> Man, I was like, that's abrupt. I... That's, uh, that's a, that's a that's a USP. Like, that's how my interviews end. Uh, I'm so glad we did this. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the last part you heard, um, but yeah, I got a newfound respect for anybody who does podcasts. If all the things you got to have set up and plugged in, <laughs> firing on all cylinders. <laughs> Everyone thinks it's so much easier than it actually is. There's there's so much work that goes into it behind the scenes. Like some people people at home. You have no idea how much hard work goes into what Dan does. It's uh, he, he works hard for you. He works hard for this podcast. It's, it's, a, it's a love. It's a labor of love. It really is. Yeah. I, I had somebody ask me when I was telling them about the podcast. And I think I was two or three episodes in. And they said, well, can you make any money at it? And I said, well, eventually. But if you're going in with that mindset of, Wow, I want to be the next Mark Marin or Joe Rogan. Everybody uses Rogan as an example. Not, I mean, I respect how he got there, but um, but yeah, if if that's what you're going for, maybe it's like selling real estate. You should probably think of another way to make a lot of money because that's not my goal. I would, I just mm -hmm. want to be able to reach as many people as I can with. Yeah, being, being it's a similar thing with being an being a musician. It's like if you're obviously, I I do want to make money doing this. I would. I've always said that I I have no need to be rich. Uh, I just want to be able to make enough money from doing this so that I don't have to do anything else to make money. Uh, but if you're in this game to make money, and that's the the primary reason that you're in it, then may I suggest a career in finance. Um, because <laughs> it, this, there are easier ways to make money than being than doing anything creative. Because unfortunately, the way that it all works is that creative work is not valued in the way that perhaps it should be. Um, but uh, yeah, it's yeah, there are easier ways to make money. That's for, that's for, for damn sure. So whilst I respect what your uh, what your friend uh, was was saying. Um, yeah that's that's not why we're doing it if we can make money from doing all this then great but that's uh that's not the primary motivator for us to do it well dan um you've been so generous with your time here i hope it's been worthwhile i usually wind down with some uh random <laughs> questions just some yes or no skittles or m&ms type nonsense uh your your mic, I think there's there's like a there's something some scratching or had something happening on your mic because uh, a couple of times how about now? Uh, someone's kind of going on the microphone. Uh, how about now? Uh, that's all right at the moment. Yeah, it just it was it's strange. It was like it was intermittent. It just like came and went. I, maybe because we got off of the uh, original call, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm not sure. It's, it almost sounded like you were like. If you had like a like a lapel mic and you were just like going like scratching it. Oh, yeah, I could see that. Okay. You got time for maybe three or four questions? Yeah, totally, man. I've got time. I'm good. Okay. Where so over here in the States, you know, we do our shopping at Publix, Target, Walmart. Oh my gosh. Uh, I mean, anybody listening to the show who works at Walmart, uh, I have nothing against you. I'm just not a big fan of your store uh, or the experience <laughs> and where do you guys do your shopping for your essentials your groceries and then okay. i have a follow-up question okay sure we've we've got um we've got a couple of uh of like of, of what we'd call supermarket stores uh like tesco is one that we use that's like that's they're, they're 
they are one of the uh they're the largest like private employer in the country um and the second largest employer overall behind the national health service uh, I found it. My, my wife used to work for their head office. So that's how I know those details. Uh, there's other places. There's Asda, which is uh, owned by Walmart. Um, there's Sainsbury's, uh, Aldi, Lidl, uh, Waitrose. That's kind of a, like a more upmarket one. Um, Morrison's. Yeah, it's, there's, lo there's lots of like these different like uh superstore brand places and they're all they're all like a different size as well they've got like different categories of stores like you've got like the superstore ones where you can have like you've got like clothes and uh electronics and stuff in there and then you've just got all the way down to um like the little there was like almost like little corner shop uh versions where it's like they just have your basic groceries and like you can pick up the paper or whatever in there and or or, or your magazines or, or or just your beer um but yeah, there's we have we have a, a plethora of choices in the UK. Well, we have Aldi. The, we're starting to see more Aldi over here. And oh, okay. Didn't realize well, I got to see you guys. Yeah, it's uh, I, I like Aldi. It's a, a little bit different experience. My the question I have that connects to this: mm -hmm. Do you ever, or do you ever wish? <laughs> let me back up. Are, do you ever jump on the back of your shopping cart and take it for a ride through the parking lot? You know, when you're hitting a, a little, um, a little patch there where you can really get some speed. And is that? Do you ever see anybody do that, or you ever go for it every once in a while? All the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, my I wife would, gets so upset with me. <laughs> I was Dan. I, I was will, so. I will push it down the aisle and kind of like lean over the bar and make sure my feet are dangling in the air. Yes. Probably also shouting, wee! <laughs> I think that's the bit that upsets my wife. I was but, thinking about that all day and I was thinking, I hope Dan says yes. Oh God, yes, absolutely. It's, I, I, I am 37, but that does not mean I'm a grown up. <laughs> Do you have the accelerator hand dryer in restrooms? in the uk uh, it is basically a, a high-powered air blaster where you, you know in lieu of paper towels you're using the the men's room and you're coming out do, do they have those uh we have um yeah we, we have something similar like we used to have like the, the, the we used to have like the good old-fashioned hair dry, uh, the hand dryers that uh that would just ineffectually sort of spit air at you and now <laughs> There's a, there's a brand, there's a brand that's it's UK, a UK based brand called Dyson, uh, which um, they, they, they regulate, they, their main sort of stock and trade is vacuum cleaners, but they also do these, they, they have things called air blades as well, where it's like you put your hands in it and it's like this one big like high pressured bit of air that kind of takes all the water off of your, off your hands. Um, but uh yeah, we have we do have those. Yes, <laughs> I have a I have a friend of mine who refuses to use those. He says it's just uh, he doesn't trust it. He thinks that the germs are going to be flying everywhere with your wet hands, and um, he, he just does he does not like them. But uh, okay, I'm, I'm point. Not, no, I never <laughs> thought about it actually. Um, well, because they do because they do say don't you that like when when you if you've uh, if you've if you've been to the bathroom and you've been for you know number two without getting into vulgar language <laughs> on this podcast, I don't know how much we can and can't swear. Um, can but, uh, come if, right up to the edge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you if yeah if you're going for number going for twosies, uh, then you should, when you're when you flush, you should close the lid because of something they call toilet plume, which is uh when you flush, it's like it just sort of sends a lot of the bacteria up into. <laughs> Happens, yeah, and particularly if you're in your bathroom at home, they say, yeah, that stuff just ends up landing on you. Think about that landing on your toothbrush, and then mm. that will that will make you close the lid. And it definitely worked on me. I'm like, I don't, I, I, I don't, I've not looked into it myself. I don't know how true that is, but it's enough <laughs> to make me think. Well, if there's a chance that it's true, it's not exactly hurting me to put the toilet lid down. <laughs> <laughs> so on a, on a similar note, I can kind of think that yeah i can see how like high pressure blasts of air could if you, there is any bacteria but the counterpoint to that is that it's to dry your hands after you have washed them so therefore if you have washed your hands correctly 
they shouldn't be blowing bacteria around. So there's the rebuttal to your friend is, is that, well, if that's something you're worried about, wash your hands better, man. <laughs> there you go, Jimmy. We'll go ahead and out him. Uh, he's, Please feel free, probably... Jimmy, to, to, to send your rebuttal back to me. I will happily have a very, I'll, I'll have a respectful um, debate with you about this. Uh, we, can, <laughs> we can we can disagree and like, and part as friends. That's uh, that's how I like to, to roll. Dan, when you're performing and somebody comes up to you with a request, are there's, there's probably a lot of songs where you say, hey, listen, I appreciate it, but you know, I don't really know that one, or I just, nah, I, that's not, do you have to turn a lot of people down and say, it just, I just don't play that song, or I, I'm not going to play that song, or do you get people to ask you to play songs that you think, dude, could you have come up with something besides Freebird or, <laughs> without, I mean, Freebird's not really the best example, but. I mean, that that's, uh, it, it, that is the, uh, that's the quintessential one, isn't it? Like the, uh, the, the quintessential heckle from somewhere in the audience is hearing, <laughs> and you just go oh don't be that guy come on that's a that's a cliche at this point surely uh but yes to answer your question i, I do i i, I have because a lot of what i do to to try and make money from what i do is i'll do like the covers shows so i'll just go to uh, a bar on a friday night and play a set of of cover tunes and um there are there are some people who will ask, ah, oh, can you play, can you play this song? And, and to be fair, most of the time, if I don't know, if I know it, then, then I'll go, yeah, sure, I can, I can, I can do that. If I know, if I know it and I haven't played it yet, obviously. Um, but uh, if I, if I don't know it and I, and I say, I'm really sorry, man, I don't know that song. For the most part, they're kind of like, they're like, oh, okay, no, yeah, no worries. No, no problem. Or in the very least, they'll be all very obviously disappointed, but like respectful about it. Occasionally, you know, I, I work in a, it's a line of work where I can encounter a lot of drunk people um, and and a lot sometimes drunk people aren't very polite or um, reasonable. Or, or they wore three hours ago, but then now they've had. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm sure they are. And, and the rest of their life. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I have I have caught them at uh, their most in, uninhibited. Uh, but, um, yeah, there are certain songs that people will call and I'll just say no like uh, the um the go to one is uh, the, the, this, this is also another cliche and I, I don't know if it's as big a cliche in the US uh, because obviously it's a, a British based band but um uh, Wonderwall by Oasis is like sure particularly as a, a guy up on stage with an acoustic guitar it's like people go like there are certain people when they're really drunk will be like but what do we? And it's like I have real opinions about playing wonder about about Wonderwall and like the when people call that out and and I'm sure this is not true of everybody at all, but it just makes people come across like the worst Gen X bores who like think music stopped in its entirety in the year 1995. No new songs have come out since then. Wonderwall was the end of music and they've they, they've not de developed their imagination probably because they took one too many pills in the 90s right that is th that is as broad stroke and aggressive as I get about my music opinions I'm sorry if there are <laughs> any people out there who love Wonderwall and that does not reflect uh, their life at all because you know all shapes and sizes all walks of life and everything else but uh, yeah there are I have encountered the, a, a lot of the, the most aggressive, uh, difficult people I've ever encountered in this job are the Wonder War crowd, the Oasis crowd. Like, oh, okay, it's another one of these guys. All right, cool. We're doing I, that thing tonight. Fine. How do uh, how do people in the U? <laughs> <laughs> I could see that when I was. Um... I did some college radio in the late 90s in a band that I really, uh, I guess I could say fell in love with, but they turned me on to um, really open up my eyes to some new music was The Verve and Richard Ashcroft. And oh, yeah. is, is he still pretty well regarded around there? Did, uh, have you seen him perform or do you like his music? 
do you know what? He's he's one of those guys. Uh, the the verb and Richard Ashcroft is uh, he is he's well regarded. He's he's one of those people that's just never really been on my radar that much. Not just because not because I I don't like it or anything, but the only the only song that there's like, Bittersweet Symphony is like the big one of theirs yeah. that that gets played a lot over here. I, I, I it always just makes me think of the movie Cruel Intentions because it's just it's in the the finale of that. Oh, excuse me. Um, mm -hmm. But then there's the, the song that the drugs don't work, um, which I know I've heard, but I, for the life of me, I can't even remember how it goes right now. And so that's it, it's just like they're just a blind spot in my um, in my musical uh, education. Because I, I think we've all got that with certain bits of pop culture. It's like uh, for, for, a, for a very long time, I hadn't seen the movie Schindler's List. And people said to me, you've never seen Schindler's List. And I'm like. No, I just <laughs> haven't got around to it. And then one of them I did, and I'm glad I did because it's a great piece of art. But uh, yeah, it was just one of those things of I hadn't got around to it. My wife, when we met, she'd never seen any of the Toy Story films and she was 30 when we'd met. And we kind of, of that generation, like how have you gone through life with that? There was a bunch of Disney movies that she'd not seen because she's a little bit older than me. So there are, a couple, there are a couple that from like that Disney Renaissance period, like around like The Lion King and everything. Where, that she missed those so yeah i guess so by the point that i'm making is yeah richard ashcroft from the verb are just a, a one of those for me it's just like they've just we've just not crossed paths properly you know if you have missed a lot of those children's movies growing up you get a chance to catch up on them when if you have a child <laughs> you see if all you have of a them child, you see. You, and you have a pandemic going on and a disney <laughs> plus subscription <laughs> Um, Dan, what, speaking of, of, um, well, let's just say what, what's your favorite or one of your favorite albums to listen to front to back, something that maybe you liked, you've liked ever since you were 19, 20, 25, is there a band or an album? I know you mentioned Fleetwood Mac, is there? Uh, yeah, I mean, ri yeah, Rumors by Fleetwood Mac is, is a timeless classic that I, I got into when I that they were a, a blind spot for me for a while. But I got into Fleetwood Mac when I was twenty two, uh, and um, I I was I was watching I was li I was getting my first tattoo done uh, at my uh, my my university friend's flat. Uh, he, he had a friend who who came by who was a tattoo artist, and so she was in town, so she was doing sort of like cheaper tattoos for for his friends. It was all she was all licensed and everything. It wasn't like backroom dodgy stuff uh but uh to distract me when i was getting my tattoo done on my arm uh he was playing guitar hero in the corner uh and a song came on and i was like dude what is this and he said oh, it's fleetwood mac and i'm like okay cool i i guess i'm into fleetwood mac now it was the song go your own way which is oh to my to, to, for my money still like one one of the all-time like great songs and uh and I, and yeah so that, that i then went and listened to particularly the rumors album but like a bunch of their their back catalog and i was shocked by how many of the songs i actually knew because i'd heard other artists play them like um uh, eva cassidy did a cover of uh of songbird which is uh her version's beautiful but like the original that christine b wrote was amazing uh dreams by stevie nicks that's uh th that was covered by uh, an irish band called the cause uh and then of course the the song the chain that that great bass line that that was the the theme tune for formula one racing in uh in the uk so like that's it, all of that whenever that that like grand if it was formula one or grand prix um but yeah like there's a there was like a car a, a race a car racing thing where like that the, the theme tune for it in the uk was that section of the chain so like listening to the record i'm like oh my god i know this oh my god i know this and it's and it's like you like we were saying earlier on about some of those songs it's like they're just they're, like you said they're not 70s songs they're just they're songs for all time you will just you can listen to that album at any time and i'm i'm pretty sure that a thousand years from now if human society hasn't completely collapsed there will be people picking up rumors and go, oh my God, man, this is so relevant to today, even though this came out over a, a millennia ago. So yeah, I guess rumors is one. Um, <laughs> uh, I think, but go ahead, I was gonna just say, it's incredible that, Fleet, I mean, Fleetwood Mac was, a, was bound 
to implode or disband. You just think about the, the huge personalities in that band and the potential clashes um, that ended up happening. But the fact that they were able to keep that unit together to create those songs before they had to go their separate ways for what a couple of decades, it's just, I mean, it's wonderful that. that yeah, I mean, room, rumors especially, it's like, it's it's an even more remarkable achievement that it's considering that what the state of just the absolute dire state of their personal relationships at the time, like John McVie and Christine McVie were getting a divorce during they, they broke up and got divorced whilst they were making that album. Uh, Stevie Nicks and Lindsay Buckingham broke up during that album. Mick Fleetwood was going for a divorce with his wife whilst they were making that album. And it's like, the fact that they didn't just all scream F you and leave uh, is, is cause for like, like that's that's impressive enough. But then not only did they stay and they finish an album, the album that they made is an absolute timeless classic that, like I said, is still, you, you listen to it now and it's like, it's just, it sounds just as powerful as it did in 1977 when it came out. It's yeah, it's just it's just remarkable. Like they again, you said they they obviously went their separate ways before coming back, and then they've gone and done it again because Lindsay Buckingham has gone from the band now, and sadly Christine McVie is no longer with us. So I'll mm -hmm. never get to see that era that lineup of Fleetwood Mac, and that's something I'm very very bitter about. But yeah, like who knows? Maybe that that those that they those guys are kind of destined to uh, come together and break apart until. Well, until they all, like Christine McVeigh's done, until they all start shuffling off this mortal coil. One, one track there, I was looking at the dance, and I, I was trying to remember this song that I love so much, I'm So Afraid. It's oh. the fifth one, right after they perform Rhiannon. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan, I think that, and I, I got to go back and listen to it, see how much orchestration is going on, but uh, just hearing that song in my mind, I feel like that's, if I saw you perform live and I wanted to throw a real wild card out there, I'd say, "Hey Dan, could you play I'm so afraid?" <laughs> I think oh, you might be able to do it. Might be able to do it justice. That's um, what well, one, thank you for the compliment. Uh two, challenge accepted. I'm going to go and have a look <laughs> and see if there's a if there's a version of that I can put together. That's a that's a great cut. That's a good that's a great the, choice. The vocals especially uh Lindsay Buckingham's vocal, I think he's lead vocals on that song. He yeah. is, yeah. You, you should hear if you've not heard it. You, hear, you should hear the the album version, which is on the album that came before Rumors, which is like their second their second self titled because there's a self titled one from back in the sixties when they were a British like blues band, uh, and then the Lindsay Buckingham Stevie Nicks era was kicked off by a second self titled one, and I'm so afraid is on that. It's it sounds largely the same, but there's kind of there's lots of like dual guitars and things on. On the original and it, the key is a little bit higher so it's so it's an interesting listen to hear the, the dance version versus that one but uh yeah if you've not heard it check that out okay well is there um any other bands or or podcasts that you listen to something that you'd like to promote things i'd like to promote oh god um there's a podcast and stuff uh nothing that's jumping out at me at the moment i i mean uh, Frank Turner is a is an artist that's very dear to to my heart. Uh, he's a he's an English singer songwriter. Uh, I I take a lot of my cues from from him. He's like nine albums into his career. He's about about to have his his tenth one now. Um, very excited for that that album to come out. But uh, yeah, he's a, a, any album of his his most recent one is an album called FTHC, which is short for Frank Turner Hardcore, which is like a t-shirt design that he had for a while um that album is is outstanding start to finish uh his his very first album sleep is for the week is in but week is spelled w-e-e-k like as in you can sleep in the weekday um love iron song the album that came off it frank turner's back cut catalog everybody just go and check all check all of that out he's a difficult man to pin down in terms of which one is is his is best he takes a lot of his cues from people like bruce springsteen so like that's that sort of gives you the idea like if you had like bruce springsteen with a very decidedly english voice 
then yeah, you've kind of you're getting closer to what he's all about. Uh, no, oh, have, wanted... have you heard uh, the band The Bug Club? The Bug Club, no, but bug is uh, in like, insect. Yeah, I believe it's the Bug Club of my friend Tom Quee from the Alpha Metallica podcast. He he turned me on to them, and I know they 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 perform in the UK. They may be based there as well. Yeah, the Bug Club. All right, um, I'm going to write that one down. I'm going to I'm going to give that a Google in a bit. I don't even know what uh, how to describe the genre, but um, uh, out in the streets is a single. Um, yeah, that's one I would throw out there, and I was I'm just uh, wondering maybe if some of my other listeners in the UK have heard of uh, heard of this band as well. But he threw it out there. I checked him out. I really like it. it. It was way off my radar. I've got the the Bug Club. Uh, there's some there's some songs. Uh, it's art, marriage, yesterday's paper. Is that we're we looking at the same band? Um, there'd be Pure Particles. That's one of their albums. Uh, let's see songs. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, marriage uh, is a single. Uh, yeah. Green in F sharp. That's it. Um, that's a good I, to know. I would say some of their subject matter, the, the lyrical content is often irreverent. Um, okay. So it's kind of silly, like uh, short and round, uh, six o'clock news. Um, but just to throw a couple of the, those out there. Uh, we can't all play saxophones. That's, that's a great yeah. title. <laughs> yeah. They're good, at least for some comic relief, because I, I played it and my, uh, he's almost six, but my five-year-old in the back seat, he loves uh, Out in the Streets, I think it is. It's, it's, it's some of the stuff, you if you listen to it, it's real catchy, even for uh, your kid. You could play it if you're riding around with your kid. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I'm looking, I, was, I've, I can see here, like, it's got, like, fans also, like, and... There's a bunch of bands there who I've I was I was just trying to see if there's anything like that I can latch on to in terms of like if there's bands that I recognize. There are no bands I recognize in there, but to me that is a uh, that's that just means oh I've got a whole bunch of other bands to go check out now too. So that's cool. Well, Dan, I don't know uh, when or how you could ever make it over here. I'm on the Gulf Coast of Florida, close to the Alabama border in the states. Um, but we've got certainly has some venues over here. If you ever come stateside and make it this far down, <laughs> would love to see you. One day, I I would love to. I've, I've looked I've looked at into kind of coming and doing some shows in the states before. But um, yeah, your 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 visa rules are a little bit on the restrictive and expensive side at the moment for me. But I trust me, as, as soon as I am possibly able, because I will I will play anywhere and everywhere that people will have me. And if if there is if there's a room full or even half full of uh, people who are willing to listen, yep, I'll, I will find ways of doing it and be there. Well, everybody listening, again, if you're like me and you live in the States um, or you're just not going to be able to see Dan perform in person for a long time, there's plenty of stuff out there to sink your, sink your teeth into. Go to the website. I'm, I didn't write it down, but danthomasmusic.com. Uh, it's it's Dan Thomas solo. It's like it's because it's like my name and then solo is in. I'm a solo performer. The only way it's that's also my handle on the socials. The only way I've ever been able to get people to remember it is it's Dan, short for Daniel Thomas, like the tank engine solo, as in Han Solo. That's the that's the only mnemonic device I've ever been able to come up with. Because the reason being is that having a name like Dan Thomas makes me really really difficult to Google. You just get a lot of Welsh guys on Facebook because Thomas is a very common Welsh surname for those not in the know. Um, but uh, yeah, so my because my mother didn't give me an out there interesting name, and I have a very flat sounding surname, second name as well. Uh, it's, um, yeah, I had to just just put if I just put danthomas.com, I that's taken. Let's put it that way. I, I can see that. I can see somebody it. already took Dan Thomas music. That was and it's not even, uh, paid, not even being used anymore. Mm, so frustrating. Uh, <laughs> but yes, danthomassolo.com. D A N T H O M A S S O L O dot com. Well, folks, find him on, on Facebook, on all the socials. Check out the videos, the Darkness and Me video, crawling on the floor, uh, holding on to you. Uh, I think you're going to find something 
that will appeal to you. Um, Dan, I, I hope I didn't take up too much of your time. I have just had a ball speaking to you for, for you this evening. And for me, it's getting late afternoon, but uh, the sun is still shining. I, I, I'm, I'm glad you guys have got sunshine. The weather is miserable over here. And also, yeah, it's, it's, it's late at night now, so it's, it's dark. But uh, uh, not at all. I've, I've, had, I've genuinely had a blast talking to you, and this has been a lot of fun. So thank you. Thank you for having me on. And uh, thank you, listeners at home, for checking out Dan's podcast and uh, listening to me chat rubbish for uh, way too long. <laughs> I hope and... I didn't tell you too much. <laughs> No, no, you're just fine, Dan. Um, November 19th, this will be relevant. Uh, when this comes out, you got a show at Berg Wallace. Am I pronouncing that correctly? The Berg Wallace? Yep, the Berg Wallace in a place called Berg Wallace, which is, it's, uh, it's outside Doncaster, uh, for those who are unfamiliar with it. But yes, that's, that's going to be a great show. We had a, we had a good show there in the summer. And uh, yeah, we're expecting good things out of that one. So my listeners in the UK, if you're listening to this episode and you got plans that night, it's time to break those plans and go listen to Dan. You're going to have a fun evening and you'll hear some storytelling. Like you said, Dan, don't some people um, maybe don't want to hear all of the storytelling, but Hey, I sure would. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yeah. Some people, some people don't particularly warm to it, but uh, I'd just argue that maybe my show is not necessarily for them. And that's, that's sad, but that's okay. Uh, yeah. I just, I like to, I'd like to tell the stories. Okay, everybody. Well, that's it for this episode of Dan Time. And remember, find a common thread with folks. Get out there um, when you see people who are a little closed off, um, maybe seem a little, sometimes you might read people wrong. They might seem arrogant or off-putting. They may just be trying to get comfortable again and they're trying, you know, or they may have just, lost a loved one you never really know what's going on with people so um yeah try to find a common thread get out there have some fun with yourself i always come back to that theme uh get on the back of a, a buggy shopping cart uh be goofy around your kid your kid wants to see you be a goofball do not be so uptight uh around your kids i at this part of the show dan at the end i always ramble and it, I never quite know how I'm going to land it, but <laughs> thank <laughs> no, you so great. much. I, I was going to add to, add to that in in the, all of that uh, uh, in the in the spirit of what you were saying is there's a great line in the show Ted Lasso uh, where he says, "Be curious, not judgmental." That's perfect. Be curious. Be curious, not judgmental. It's uh, yeah, like you say, you don't know always know what's going on with people and. Uh, yeah, just approach everything with curiosity and empathy and you will go far. It's not something that we're always able to do. God knows I struggle with it sometimes and fall short, but uh, I always try and make it right when I realize that I've got it wrong. And if you've got an idea, Dan will tell you, get it down on paper. If you've been sitting on this for a while, if, if the pandemic um, took the wind out of your sail, Maybe, maybe right now is not exactly the right time, but keep that, you got that uh, idea. Um, don't forget to write it out. If you've got that guitar, it's been sitting there, pick it up, start writing. Uh, but Dan, this has been perfect. I would love to have you back on. Um, if we could do another episode uh, next year sometime, are you in? Absolutely. Yeah, I yeah you 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 name the time and the place, man, and I will I, and I will uh, I will I'll move some things around and I'll make it happen. Okay, Dan, have a great night, and uh, folks, be good, and I'll see you next Sunday on the Dan Time Podcast.